Thank you. Order. Statement. The Prime Minister. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on the Government's work to secure a withdrawal agreement that can command the support of this House. A fortnight ago, I committed to come back before the House today if the Government had not by now secured a majority for a withdrawal agreement and a political declaration. In the two weeks since, my right honourable friends, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, the Attorney General and I, have been engaging in focused discussions with the EU to find a way forward that will work for both sides, and we are making good progress in that work. I had a constructive meeting with President Juncker in Brussels last week to take stock of the work done by our respective teams. We discussed the legal changes that are required to guarantee that the Northern Ireland backstop cannot endure indefinitely. On the political declaration, we discussed what additions or changes can be made to increase confidence in the focus and ambition of both sides in delivering the future partnership we envisage as soon as possible, and the Secretary of State is following this up with Michel Barnier. I also had a number of positive meetings at the EU League of Arab States Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, including with President Donald Tusk. I have now spoken to the leaders of every single EU member state to explain the UK's position, and the UK and EU teams are continuing their work, and we agreed to review progress again in the coming days. As part of these discussions, the UK and EU have agreed to consider a joint work stream to develop alternative arrangements to ensure the absence of a hard border in Northern Ireland. This work will be done in parallel with the future relationship negotiations and is without prejudice to them. Our aim is to ensure that, even if the full future relationship is not in place by the end of the implementation period, the backstop is not needed because we have a set of alternative arrangements ready to go. And I want to thank my honourable and right honourable friends for their contribution to this work and reaffirm that we are seized of the need to progress that work as quickly as possible. President Juncker has already agreed that the EU will give priority to this work, and the Government expects that this will be an important strand of the next phase. The Secretary of State for exiting the EU will be having further discussions with Michel Barnier, and we will announce details ahead of the meaningful vote. We will also be setting up domestic structures to support this work, including ensuring we can take advice from external experts involved in customs processes around the world, from businesses who trade with the EU and beyond, and, of course, from colleagues across the House. This will all be supported by civil service resource, as well as funding for the Government to help develop, test and pilot proposals which can form part of these alternative arrangements. Mr Speaker, I know what this House needs in order to support a withdrawal agreement. The EU knows what is needed, and I am working hard to deliver it. As well as changes to the backstop, we are also working across a number of other areas to build support for the withdrawal agreement and to give the House confidence in the future relationship that the UK and EU will go on to negotiate. This includes ensuring that leaving the EU will not lead to any lowering of standards in relation to workers' rights, environmental protections or health and safety. Taking back control cannot mean giving up our control of these standards, especially when UK governments of all parties have proudly pursued policies that exceed the minimums set by the EU, from Labour giving British workers more annual leave to the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats giving all employees the right to request flexible working. Not only would giving up control go against the spirit of the referendum result, it would also mean accepting new EU laws automatically, even if they were to reduce workers' rights or change them in a way that was not right for us. Instead, and in the interests of building support across the House, we are prepared to commit to giving Parliament a vote on whether it wishes to follow suit whenever the EU standards in areas such as workers' rights and health and safety are judged to have been strengthened. The Government will consult with businesses and trade unions as it looks at new EU legislation and decides how the UK should respond. We will legislate to give our commitments on both non-regression and future developments force in UK law. And following further cross-party talks, we will shortly be bringing forward detailed proposals to ensure that as we leave the EU, we not only protect workers' rights, but continue to enhance them. Mr Speaker, as the Government committed to the House last week, we are today publishing the paper assessing our readiness for no deal. I believe that if we have to, we will ultimately make a success of a no deal. But this paper, 
But, but this. But this paper provides an honest assessment of the very serious challenges it would bring in the short term and further reinforces why the best way for this House to honour the referendum result is to leave with a deal. As I committed to the House, the Government will today table an amendable motion for debate tomorrow. But I know members across the House are genuinely worried that time is running out, that if the Government... That if the gov- that if the Government doesn't come back with a further meaningful vote, or it loses that vote, Parliament won't have time to make its voice heard on the next steps. I know too that members across the House are deeply concerned by the effect of the current uncertainty on businesses. So today I want to reassure the House by making three further commitments. First, we will hold a second meaningful vote by Tuesday the 12th of March at the latest. Second, If the Government has not won a meaningful vote by Tuesday the 12th of March, then it will, in addition to its obligations, to table a neutral amendable motion under Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act, table a motion to be voted on by Wednesday the 13th of March at the latest, asking this House if it supports leaving the EU without a withdrawal agreement and a framework for a future relationship on the 29th of March. So the United Kingdom will only leave without a deal on the 29th of March if there is explicit consent in the House for that outcome. Third, third, if the House, having rejected leaving with the deal negotiated with the EU, then rejects leaving on the 29th of March without a withdrawal agreement and future framework, the Government will, on the 14th of March, bring forward a motion on whether Parliament wants to seek a short, limited extension to Article 50, and if the House votes for an extension, seek to agree that extension approved by the House with the EU, and bring forward the necessary legislation to change the exit date commensurate with that extension. These commitments all fit the timescale set out in the Private Members' Bill in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford. They are commitments I am making as Prime Minister, and I will stick by them as I have previous commitments. As, as, I, have, as I have previous commitments to make statements and table amendable motions by specific dates. But let me be clear. I do not want to see Article 50 extended. Our absolute focus should be on working to get a deal and leaving on the 29th of March. An extension beyond the end of June would mean the UK taking part in the European Parliament elections. What kind of message would that send to the more than 17 million people who voted to leave the EU nearly three years ago now? And the House, the House should be clear that a short extension, not beyond the end of June, would almost certainly have to be a one-off. If we had not taken part in the European Parliament elections, it would be extremely difficult to extend again. So it would create a much sharper cliff edge in a few months' time. An extension cannot take no deal off the table. The only way to do that is to revoke Article 50, which I, which I shall not do, or agree a deal. Now, I have been clear throughout the process that my aim is to bring the country back together. This House, this House can only do that by implementing the decision of the British people and the Government is determined to do so in a way that commands the support of this House. But just as Government requires the support of this House in delivering the vote of the British people, so the House should respect the proper functions of the Government. Tying the Government's hands by seeking to commandeer the order paper would have... Would have far. This is rather discourteous. The Prime Minister is delivering a statement, and it should be heard. And colleagues know, I understand the strong feelings, colleagues know from the record that everybody will get the chance to question the Prime Minister, but the Prime Minister's statement must be heard. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tying the Government's hands by seeking to commandeer the order paper would have far reaching implications 
for the way in which the United Kingdom is governed and the balance of powers and responsibilities in our democratic institutions. And it would offer no solution to the challenge of finding a deal which this House can support. Neither would seeking an extension to Article 50 now make getting a deal any easier. Ultimately, the choices we face would remain unchanged. Leave with a deal, leave with no deal, or have no Brexit. So when it comes to that motion tomorrow, the House needs to come together as we did on the 29th of January and send a clear message that there is a stable majority in favour of leaving the EU with a deal. Now, a number of honourable and right honourable members have understandably raised the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. As I set out last September following the Salzburg summit, even in the event of no deal, the rights of the three million EU citizens living in the UK will be protected. That is our guarantee to them. They are our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues. We want them to stay. But a separate agreement for citizens' rights is something the EU have been clear they do not have the legal authority for. If it is not done in a withdrawal agreement, these issues become a matter for Member States unless the EU were to agree a new mandate to take this forward. At the very start of this process, the UK sought to separate out this issue, but that was something which the EU has been consistent on. However, my right hon. Friend, the Foreign Secretary, has written to all of his counterparts, and we are holding further urgent discussions with Member States to seek assurances on the rights of UK citizens. I urge all EU countries to make this guarantee and end the uncertainty for these citizens. And I hope that the Government's efforts can give the House and EU citizens here in the UK the reassurances they need and deserve. Mr Speaker, for some honourable and right honourable members, taking the United Kingdom out of the European Union is the culmination of a long and sincerely fought campaign. For others, leaving the EU goes against much that they have stood for and fought for with equal sincerity for just as long. But Parliament gave the choice to the people. In doing so, we told them we would honour their decision. That remains the resolve of this side of the House. But last night we learned that it is no longer the commitment of the Leader of the Opposition. He has, he has gone back on his promise to respect the referendum result and now wants to hold a divisive second referendum that would take our country right back to square one. Anybody who voted Labour at the last election because they thought he would deliver Brexit will rightly be appalled. This House voted to trigger Article 50 and this House has a responsibility to deliver on the result. The very credibility of our democracy is at stake. By leaving the EU with a deal, we can move our country forward. Even with the uncertainty we face today, we have more people in work than ever before. Wages growing at their fastest rate for a decade. And debt falling as a share of the economy. If we can leave with a deal, end the uncertainty and move on beyond Brexit, we can do so much more to deliver real economic progress to every part of the country. So I hope tomorrow this House can show that with legally binding changes on the backstop, commitments to protect workers' rights and the environment, an enhanced role for Parliament in the next phase of negotiations, and a determination to address the wider concerns of those who voted to leave, we will have a deal that this House can support. And in doing so, that we send a clear message that this House is resolved to honour the result of the referendum and leave the European Union with a deal. And I commend this statement to the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to start by thanking the Prime Minister for an advanced copy of her statement. I have lost count of the number of times the Prime Minister has come to this House to explain a further delay. They say, Mr Speaker, history repeats itself, first time as tragedy, second time as farce. By the umpteenth time, it can only be described as grotesquely reckless. This is not dithering, it is a deliberate strategy to run down the clock. The Prime Minister is promising to achieve something she knows is not achievable and is stringing people along. 
So will she be straight with people? The withdrawal agreement is not being reopened. There is no attempt to get a unilateral exit on the backstop or a time limit. In Sharm el Sheikh, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, a delay in this process doesn't deliver a decision in Parliament, it doesn't deliver a deal. I can only assume she was being self critical. She so far promised a vote on a deal in December, January, February, and now March, and only managed to put a vote once in January when it was comprehensively defeated. The Prime Minister continues to say that it's her deal or no deal. But this House has decisively rejected her deal and has clearly rejected no deal. It is the Prime Minister's obstinacy that is blocking a resolution. So if the House confirms that, oppos that opposition, then what is the Prime Minister's plan B? And I pay tribute to others across the House who are working on such solutions, whether that's what the proposal, what is commonly known as Norway Plus, or other options. Labour, I would like to inform the House, will back the Costa Amendment if tabled tomorrow and also confirm that we will back the amendment drafted by the Honourable Member for South Leicestershire on securing citizens' rights for EU citizens here and for UK citizens in Europe, some of whom I met in Spain last week. The Prime Minister has become quite the expert at kicking the can down the road. But the problem is the road is running out, and the consequences of running down the clock are evident and very real for industry and for people's jobs. For now, the Prime Minister states that can, the can can be kicked until the 12th of March, but the EU cannot ratify any deal now until its leaders' summit on the 21st of March. After all, Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act states that the final agreement is laid before this House before it can be voted on. So can the Prime Minister confirm how can there be a vote in this House if the EU has not yet agreed any final exit? Or is the Prime Minister now saying that there will be no change to either the withdrawal agreement or to the political declaration, and so will we be voting again on the same documents? Every delay, every bit of badly made fudge just intensifies the uncertainty for industry, business investments being held back, jobs being lost, and yet more jobs being put at risk. The real-life consequences of the Prime Minister's cynical tactics are being felt across the country. Factories relocating abroad, jobs being lost, investment being cancelled, thousands of workers at sites across, across Britain's towns and cities are hearing rumours and fearing for the worst. The responsibility for this lies exclusively with the Prime Minister and her government's shambolic handling of Brexit. Even now, even now, Mr Speaker, with just one month to go before our legally enshrined exit date, the Prime Minister is not clear what she wants in renegotiations that have now dragged on since it became clear in December that her deal was not even backed by much of her own party, let alone Parliament or the country at large. <laughs> Labour, Mr Speaker, has a credible plan that could... <laughs> Labour, Mr Speaker... Labour has a credible plan that could bring the country together, provide certainty for people and safeguard jobs and industry. It is based around a new customs union with the EU to protect our manufacturing industry, a close alignment with the single market protecting all of our trading sectors and keeping pace with the best practice on workers' rights, environmental protections and consumer safeguards, the people of this country deserve nothing less. The Prime Minister talks about giving commitments on future developments, but that is way short of a commitment to dynamic alignments on rights and standards, when we know many on her front bench, see Brexit as an opportunity to rip up those vital protections. 
In recent weeks, Mr Speaker, I have been speaking to businesses, industry organisations and trade unions. Last week, along with uh, our Shadow Brexit Secretary, my right honourable friend, the member for Hoban and St Pancras, my friend, the member for Leeds East and Baroness Chakrabarti, I travelled to Europe to meet to meet with EU officials and leaders to discuss the crisis and explain Labour's proposals. We left, we left with no doubt whatsoever that our proposals are workable and could be negotiated. So tomorrow, Mr Speaker, we will... Uh, order. I indicated to the House that the Prime Minister should be fairly and courteously heard. The same goes for the Leader of the Opposition. So if the usual suspects could just calm down, it would be in their interests and, more importantly, those of the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. So tomorrow we will ask Parliament to vote on these proposals. They are workable and negotiable that back the demands of working people all across this country and industry all across this country. So I urge members across this House to back that amendment, to respect the results of the 2016 referendum, to safeguard jobs, investment and industry in this country. Labour accepts the result of the referendum, but we believe... <laughs> But, Mr Speaker, we believe in getting the terms of our exit right. That's why we believe in our alternative plan. The Prime Minister's botched deal provides no certainty or guarantees for the future and was comprehensively rejected by this House. We cannot risk our country's industry and people's livelihoods. And so, if, somehow, if it somehow does pass in some form at a later stage, we believe there must be a confirmatory public vote to see if people feel that's what they voted for. A no-deal outcome would be disastrous, and that's why we committed to backing the amendment in the names of my right honourable friend, the member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, and the right honourable mem member for West Dorset, to rule out that reckless cliff-edge Brexit. The Prime Minister appears to be belatedly listening to the House. Any extension is only necessary because of the Prime Minister's shambolic negotiations and her decision to run down the clock. But until the Prime Minister is clear what alternative she would put forward in the circumstances, then she is simply continuing to run down the clock. She promises a short extension, but for what? If the Government wants a genuine renegotiation, it should do so on the terms that can win a majority in this House, on terms backed by businesses and unions that are contained within Labour's amendment, which I urge the whole House to back tomorrow. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. First of all, on a couple of the questions that the Right Honourable Gentleman asked. He asked about the meaningful vote and whether there would be new documents brought before the House. Of course, we are in discussion with, with the EU about changes, about the changes that this House said they wanted to see uh, in relation to, uh, to the backstop for Northern Ireland. It is those that we are discussing with the European Union. And of course, any changes that uh, are agreed with the European Union would be put before this House before the meaningful vote. He raised the issue of citizens' rights, as I covered in my statement. It is not possible that the EU does not have legal authority to do a separate deal itself on citizens' rights without a new mandate. This is a matter, unless it is part of the withdrawal agreement, and obviously we have negotiated something within the withdrawal agreement, uh, good rights for citizens within the withdrawal agreement. If it is not within that withdrawal agreement, then it is a matter for individual member states, and we have taken that issue up with individual member states. A number of them have already given good guarantees to UK citizens. We are encouraging those who haven't uh, to do so. 
He uh, referred to the issue of workers' rights. I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, I think it's important not that he says he wants dynamic. Uh, well, I'm, I'm answering the points that he's made. He doesn't seem to be too interested in the listens in the uh, answers I'm giving. He asked about dy- he, he advocated dynamic alignment on workers' rights. I have to say we think on this side of the house that those decisions should be taken in the UK and should be taken in this house. And and one of the reasons for taking those decisions on workers' rights in this House is because governments, as I said, of different colours in this country have consistently given uh, greater rights to workers than the European Union has negotiated. Uh, he asked. He referenced. He referenced the issue of the. Uh, he referenced the issue of the Labour Party's approach to a deal. And of course, the Labour Party's approach to a deal is that they do want a customs union and to be in the single market with a say on trade deals. In that sort of, um, well, please, if you're very nice to us, can we sit around the table and maybe sometime we might be able to put an opinion from us on the uh, on the trade deals? If he wants the benefits of a customs union, no tariffs, no fees, no charges, those are there within the political declaration in the deal that has been negotiated by this government. But what we also have in that political declaration is the right for us as an independent country to strike our own trade deals again and not to be uh, relying on the trade deals struck by those in Brussels. And then he talks about the issue of the time that is running down to the 29th of March. My sole focus throughout all of this has been on getting a deal that enables us to leave the European Union on the 29th of March with a deal. It is the right honourable gentleman who has kept no deal on the table by refusing to agree to a deal. And now, and uh, he talks... He talks about uncertainty on jobs. He could have voted to end uncertainty on jobs by backing the deal the government brought back from the European Union. And finally, he says says that he and the Labour Party accept the result of the referendum. And yet we also know that they back a second referendum. And by backing a second referendum, he's breaking his promise to respect the result of the 2016 referendum. He'll be ignoring the biggest vote in our history, and he'll be betraying the trust of the British people. Mr Kenneth Clarke. Mr Speaker, uh, may I congratulate the Prime Minister on accepting that we're not remotely ready for the chaos of a no-deal departure on the 29th of March, and uh, also agreeing with her that no deal at any time would have very damaging medium and long-term prospects for the British economy and our well-being. So I I will continue to vote for any withdrawal agreement that she manages to get with the other EU countries, but I doubt she will command a majority for any such agreement in the near future. So can I turn to the real issue now, I'm afraid, which is how long is the delay we're going to be contemplating? She seems to be giving us a date for a new cliff edge at the end of June. But isn't the danger that we will merely continue the present pantomime performance through the next three months and the public will be dismayed as we approach that date and find there is similar chaos about where we are going? May I suggest that we contemplate a much calmer delay that we have indicative votes following debates in this House to see where a consensus or majority lies and then prepare our position for the much more important long-term negotiations that have to take place on the eventual (laughs) settlement. We cannot have several more years of what we've had for the last two years. We have to start proper negotiations with the EU on what exactly we contemplate as our long-term relationship with the Union. Prime Minister. My right honourable and learned friend, of course we have the framework for that long-term relationship with the European Union uh, set out in the political declaration. That is, if you like, the set of instructions to the negotiators for the next stage. But he's right, of course, we still have to go through that second stage of negotiations. He asks about the, uh, any extension to Article 50, should that be necessary. I'm very clear, I do not want to see an extension to Article 50. And should we be in the position that uh, such a proposal was put before this House, I'd want to see it being as short as possible. 
Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of her statement? I have to say I find myself once again agreeing with the Right Honourable Member for Rushcliffe. There is perhaps the possibility that we extend Article 50 beyond the end of June. And in that light, can I give a helpful suggestion to the Prime Minister? The Scottish National Party are already putting in place candidates for the European elections. Can I suggest the Conservatives might consider doing the same? <laughs> Mr. Speaker. There are only 19 parliamentary days until Brexit Day, yet the Prime Minister wants to delay the meaningful vote up to the 12th of March. Why? The 12th of March, only 10 parliamentary days before Brexit. We have lost nine days when this issue could have been resolved. The Dutch Prime Minister says we are sleepwalking into a no-deal scenario. There was no breakthrough in a 45-minute meeting with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Council President Donald (coughs) Tusk said an Article 50 extension would be the rational decision. Although, Mr Speaker, that would suggest that this government is capable of making rational decisions. (laughs) There is little evidence of that. Prime Minister, your strategy to run down the clock is disastrous. Isn't it the case that you continue to fail to reach an agreement on the backstop? Isn't it the case that you cannot get the alternative arrangements on the backstop you promised at the end of January? I'm not trying to get any alternatives to a backstop. (laughs) Through the chairman, Mr Blackford. Mr Speaker, isn't it the case that the government cannot get alternative arrangements on the backstop that were promised at the end of January because the EU will not renegotiate? The EU has repeatedly made it clear the withdrawal agreement is non-negotiable. What is it that the Prime Minister does not get of that? Prime Minister, businesses and citizens are worried about no deal, worried about the supply of medicines, worried about the supply of food. It is the height of irresponsibility for any government to threaten its citizens with these consequences. And you know, the Prime Minister sits and laughs at what she's doing to the people of the United Kingdom. What a disgrace. Mr Speaker, this Prime Minister indicates she simply is not fit for office. Prime Minister, will you accept the overwhelming advice of business, of MPs and your Cabinet? Rule out no deal, extend Article 50, but do it today. This should not be left until the middle of March. Mr Speaker, we can't trust this Prime Minister. Parliament should take the opportunity to impose the timeline that she has set out today so that the Prime Minister can't dodge this. Prime Minister! Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Gentleman referenced, uh, made various references to the discussions with the European Union. He asked why the meaningful vote uh, was not being brought back uh, this week or had not been brought back uh, bef- uh, before the wasn't being brought back uh, before the latest date of the 12th of March. The answer is, uh, to that is because we are taking this time to negotiate the changes required by this House yep. uh, in relation to the deal that we negotiated with the European Union, and that includes the work that has been done on alternative arrangements. And as I indicated in my statement, uh, further work on those alternative arrangements has already been agreed uh, with the European. Union. So all those questions about uh, there not being an opportunity to renegotiate, not being an opportunity to get any changes, uh, no, that is not the case. We are in talks with the European Union, and we're talking about the issues, and we're talking about the issues that this House required. And then finally, finally, he talked about uncertainty the uncertainty of not having uh, the uh, uh, arrangements in place. Can I just say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, if he wants to end uncertainty, if he wants to deal with the issues he raised, if he wants to end the uncertainty and deal with the issues he raised in his response to my statement, then he should vote for a deal. Simples. Ian Duncan Smith. May I, Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, may I welcome my uh, my right honourable friend? Oh, oh, oh order, I, order, order! I appeal to the House to 
give the right honourable gentleman the respectful attention that he probably wants, and I think he should have. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very kind of you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I uh, welcome uh, my right honourable friend's statement today? Uh, clearly, she is right that uh, we would prefer to have a deal. In the statement she made, she talked about alternative arrangements, which are based hugely, as it appears, on the Malthouse compromise details. Can I just remind my right honourable friend that it's clear now behind closed doors that uh, UK uh, government officials and the EU recognise that what is right now uh, in the backstop is unworkable and therefore they will have to implement alternative arrangements. Therefore, when she sits down with them to ask for this, could she now say that these alternative arrangements must reach a point of a deadline date and be bound legally so that they cannot renege from that after we leave? Prime Minister. I say to my right, uh, to my right honourable friend that, in fact, uh, there has not been the suggestion that the arrangements in the backstop are unworkable. But what there has been in the discussions with the European Union is an acceptance of the desire to actually uh, discuss those alternative arrangements, work on those, and have those in place, such that, were it the case that we ended the implementation period without the future relationship in place, and that insurance policy for no hard border in Northern Ireland was necessary, we would have the alternative arrangements to put in place, rather than the backstop as is currently within the, uh, within the uh, uh, withdrawal agreement. And the issue, one of the key issues that has been raised by the European Union around the alternative arrangements actually relates to the significant number of derogations from European Union law that will be necessary in order to put the alternative arrangements in place. Mr Hillary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. While I welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has at long last, and with the greatest reluctance, been persuaded by a group of her own ministers to accept that there is no majority in this House for leaving the European Union on the 29th of March with no deal, does she not understand that there, in all likelihood, will continue to be no majority in the House for leaving with no deal, whether it's March, June or October? And therefore, the question I want to put to her is this. If we are going to have an extension to Article 50, what does she intend to use that time for? Yeah. Prime Minister. I say to the right and honourable gentleman, as I've been very clear, I want to ensure that the work we're currently doing ensures that we get a deal that can command the support of this House. He, he says that there will continue to be. What I said in my statement is that if we don't get, if we lose another meaningful vote, and the, uh, we will then put a vote to the House on its view on leaving the European Union on the 29th of March with no deal. Uh, and, what, and were it the case that the House rejected the meaningful vote and voted uh, for not leaving without a deal, uh, then we would put that uh, a motion would come before the House in relation to a short, limited extension of Article 50. But can I also say to the right honourable gentleman that he says again, and he He's raised this previously in this House about there being no majority for leaving with no deal. As I say, the House has to face up to the fact that if it doesn't want to leave with no deal, either it wants to stay in the European Union, which will betray the trust and the vote of the British people, or it has to accept and vote for a deal. Uh, Nicky Morgan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Today's statement cannot have been easy for the Prime Minister to make because she is rightly determined that we should honour the result of the referendum. And I say that as somebody who campaigned very strongly for us to remain in the EU. But it probably hasn't been greeted uh, with great alacrity in the country as well because the uncertainty out there affecting businesses and individuals is now crushing. So can she please make it clear that a deal which can command the majority of this House is eminently possible if there can be agreement on changes to the backstop and putting in place alternative arrangements? And can she also confirm that it is then incumbent on MPs on all sides of this House to vote for this deal, which will be in the national interests of this country? Yeah. 
can I can I say to my right honourable friend, she is absolutely right that it is first of all that we are discussing, obviously in the talks with the European Union, this issue of, of delivering the changes that were required by this House in relation to the concern that the House had about the potential indefinite nature of the, the uh, backstop. Uh, that there is a prospect, I believe we do have it within our grasp, to get an agreement such that we can leave the uh, European Union on the 29th of March with a deal. And when those changes are brought back, as my right honourable friend says, I hope every member of this House will recognise their responsibility to deliver on the vote of the uh, referendum in 2016, to deliver Brexit and to do it in the best way possible, which is with a deal. Yvette Cooper. The Prime Minister has said for the first time she is willing to put a motion extending Article 50, and I hope that there, this reflects the strong arguments that have been made on all sides of the House about the damage that no deal would do to this country. But she will also know that promised votes have been pulled before, yep. Yep. that Commons motions have been ignored before. Yep. Yep and that when the Commons previously voted against No Deal, the Brexit Secretary still told the House that government policy was still to leave on the 29th of March with No Deal if the deal hadn't been passed, and he said, frankly, the legislation takes precedence over the motion. Yeah. So if there is no legislation in place, what assurances do we have that votes will definitely be put that the government will abide by any motions, that also the entire cabinet will abide by any votes, and also what will the government's policy be in those circumstances? Will it be to argue for no deal, or will it be to argue for an extension? Okay. Prime Minister. So the Right Honourable Lady. First of all, she references the Cabinet. This, this uh, has been discussed by Cabinet, so this is a position that the Government has taken, and uh, I would not have brought it before the House today if it were not a position that the uh, Government had taken in relation to this issue. Uh, I have I've set those dates. I've been clear. If the Right Honourable Lady would care to look at what I've been doing over recent weeks at points where I have said I would come back today, the previous time I came back to the House, it was a guarantee that I would come back to the House. I said I would bring a motion. We brought a motion. We will bring a motion tomorrow. So it is a clear and firm commitment from this Government to ensure that we bring those votes to this House, and the House then has the opportunity. I recognise that the concern of right honourable and honourable members for ensuring that the voice of the House is heard, and that is why I said that those votes will be brought before the House should we lose the meaningful vote. I continue to want to see this House supporting a meaningful vote so that we can leave with a deal. And as she will have heard in my statement, I said that were we in the case that a vote for a no, no deal and then a vote for an extension had been put forward, we would take that to the European Union. The decision would not be entirely ours. It is up to the unanimous decision of the 27 member states of the European Union to agree that extension. But were that agreed, we'd bring forward the necessary legislation. So William Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will my right honourable friend accept that the bill to which the uh, honourable, right honourable member for Pontefract has just referred to delay Article 50 would incur many billions of pounds of taxpayers' money? available otherwise for public services and which otherwise would not be handed over to the EU if we left on the 29th of March and that the bill is effectively aimed at overturning the democratic will of the British people which Parliament except itself expressly entrusted to the British people and must be honoured. <laughs> Prime Minister. The, my my honourable friend raises a number of points about the uh, proposed bill from the right honourable member for Normanton Castle uh, for, and Pontefract. Can I just say to my honourable friend that I think what I would hope members of this House would consider, given you know, the commitments that the Government has made in relation to these issues, but I hope that honourable members of this House would consider that actually that uh, particular, the, the mechanisms within that bill have constitutional implications beyond simply the Brexit issue in terms of the relationship between yeah. Government and Parliament and our democratic institutions going forward. I, it is important that we, I have been clear today, I want to see a deal that this House can support that enables us to leave on the 29th of March with a deal. That's what the government is working on, and that's what the government continues to work on. Yes, Vincent Cable. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister is right that simply postponing a cliff edge for three months 
is pointless or worse. But now that the Leader of the Opposition has listened to advice from his colleagues and these benches and others and accepted the principle of a people's vote with the option to remain, will she not now listen to the advice of her own ministers who were saying that a no-deal Brexit, whether it is at the end of March or the end of June, would be so damaging that it must now be firmly ruled out? Yeah. Yeah. Say to Minister. the gentleman, yet again. Uh, he talks about firmly ruling out a no-deal option. There are only two alternatives to no-deal. One is to revoke Article 50 and stay in the European Union, which we will not do, and the other is to agree a deal. So if he wants to take no-deal off the table, I hope when the deal is back, he will vote for that deal. Justine Greening. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's abundantly clear, just listening to the questions today, that there isn't a consensus in this House. And we do face gridlock. We've now run down the clock, and I think rather than wasting more time repeating votes that we've already had, and this House has already expressed its will on, for example, on no deal, for example, in relation to the government's deal and the withdrawal agreement, is it now time that we all put our effort into recognising that gridlock and taking the responsibility for deciding how we get out of it? Because I do not believe it's going to change and we can keep on going round in circles with all the damage that does to businesses and jobs or we can confront it, decision it and find a route forward for Britain. My Minister! Can I say to my right honourable friend, obviously I I recognise that uh, she feels very strongly on these uh, these issues. Um, I want to see us able to deliver on the result of the referendum and doing it in what I believe is the best way for this country, which is to leave with a deal. That's what we'll be working on. She talks about uh, decision points. There will be a decision point for this House uh, in uh, in a meaningful vote, looking at the changes that have been agreed with the European Union. And at that stage, I hope that every member of this House will recognise the need to respect the result of the referendum in 2016 and to leave the European Union with a deal. Ben Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, is not the crucial difference between what she is proposing and the proposal of the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Dorset West, and my Right Honourable Friend, who chairs the Home Affairs Select Committee, is that theirs is watertight and legally binding, and hers is not. And given the number of times that she has gone back on her word and caved into the ERG, yeah. why should we trust anything she is saying? Absolutely. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that there is a difference between the proposal that has been put forward uh, that he refers to and the commitments that I have given today, and that is that the proposal that has been put forward goes much more, wi- much more uh, uh, widely than in relation to the issue of Brexit. And it is I have a concern about the relationship in the future uh, between government and parliament about ensuring that we can continue to maintain what has been a balanced relationship between government and parliament that has stood this country well over many, many years and retaining that into the future. Mr Ian Patterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Can I congratulate the Prime Minister and the Brexit Secretary for persuading the European Union to accept a task force to work up the Alternative Group Arrangements Group proposals into a practical proposition, because what has emerged in our discussions is that the customs arrangements have been cut and pasted from the old Turkish agreement. They are archaic and would require 255 million pieces of paper to be stamped with a wet chop, as in Ming Dynasty China. What the Prime Minister would do if she could make these proposals legally binding with a definitive implementation date would be to remove the toxic backstop and get many people on this side of the House to vote for the agreement. Will she get a legally binding change in the text to deliver that? Minister. Can I say, say to my right honourable friend, um, the commitment is that we will ensure, as I said to uh, our right honourable friend, the member for Chingford and Wood Green, 
that at the point were we to get to the point of it being necessary to exercise what is uh, known as the backstop or the insurance policy for no hard border in Northern Ireland, were we to get to that point at the end of the implementation period where it was necessary, uh, we want to have the alternative arrangements ready to go at that point such that the backstop never, as currently drafted never needs to be used. That is, the, uh, that is the aim and the intent. We want to work on this quickly so that we've got those clearly uh, ready and understood before that date, but the commitment is to ensure that those alternative arrangements can indeed uh, replace the backstop and ensure that the backstop doesn't need to be used. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister's withdrawal deal uh, agreement, as proposed in draft, was defeated in this House by 230 votes. She hardly needs reminding of that. And the reason for that, primarily the loss of the majority, was because of the, the backstop. Now, she has committed to binding legal changes in terms of the backstop, effectively reopening the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and she must know that without a legally watertight way out of the backstop, then certainly we could not support any future withdrawal agreement brought to this House. Does she not think that the machinations of some of her ministers and the proposals that she has actually announced today, does she think that this will have the effect in Brussels and on European leaders of making them more likely to concede what is necessary, or perhaps that they will just sit back and wait. Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, uh, the discussions that I have had in uh, the European Union with EU leaders and indeed with the European Commission are very clear uh, that they are entering into those talks with us with the intention of finding a resolution of the issue that this House has raised, that the right honourable gentleman has just referenced again, which is ensuring that we have that legally binding change that ensures that people can have the confidence that the issue which the House raised about the potential indefinite nature of the backstop has been addressed and has been resolved. That is what we are working on. I recognise that the right honourable gentleman has always been consistent in his references to the need for the, leg the right legal status for that change, and that is what we are working for. Uh, Mr Dominic Grieve. Uh, th thank you, Mr Speaker. I am pleased to hear from my right honourable friend a willingness to consider the possibility of an extension of Article 50 to prevent a catastrophic no-deal Brexit. My right honourable friend also said, rightly, that across this House there are widely divergent views as to why the deal that she has negotiated in good faith has been rejected. And my concern is simply this. I see no reason to think that that situation will change because despite what she's done in good faith, it is a second-rate outcome for our country. And if this is to continue, how are we indeed to break the logjam? And here I have to say to her that her browbeating of the House, which she did today, indicating that unless we simply go along with a deal which is considered to be inadequate, there is no solution but a no-deal Brexit or a unilateral revocation is simply inaccurate, because surely it is perfectly possible and utterly democratic for us to go back and ask the public whether the deal she has negotiated is acceptable or not. Prime Minister. I say to, uh, first of all, to my right honourable and learned friend, uh, he says that there has been no indication from this House, that there are diverse views around this House, and no indication, therefore, as to why the withdrawal agreement was rejected. Indeed, this House did indicate why the withdrawal agreement was rejected. It did so in a majority vote on the 29th of January, which indicated that it was an issue around the backstop and changes to the backstop that were required, uh, and that the House would support a withdrawal agreement with uh, the necessary changes to the backstop. So it is not right to say that this House has not indicated the uh, result that it wishes to uh, the, the result that it, it wishes to see. Um, he also, uh, I think, um, has slightly chast aims to chastise me as to the options that I have put before the House today. But I say to him, a, a, second, a second referendum does not take out, does not change the fact that ultimately the three options open to us are to leave the European Union with a deal, to leave it with no deal, or to have no Brexit. Those will remain the options. 
<laughs> Anna Subri. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it, this is a shameful moment. Yeah. Nothing yeah. has changed yeah. apart from the fact that some of us who used to sit over there are now sitting over here. Yeah. And one of the reasons the for map. that is because yeah. yet again we see Seriously. in the Prime Minister a can kicking at the yeah. same time that fudge is being created and a failure to put the country and the nation's yeah. interests yeah. first. Yeah. Instead, the future of the Conservative Party yeah. is put yeah. first yeah. and yeah. foremost. Honourable and right honourable members who sit opposite made it clear that they would vote in accordance with their conscience and the national interest to take note. Order, order, Mr Blunt. Be quiet. Be quiet. You're not the arbiter of what the Right Honourable Lady says. I'll be the judge of that. Don't try to shout her down. It is beneath you. And more importantly, it will fail. Anna Subri. Actually, I didn't hear what the old gentleman said. It's the benefits of being older and a bit deaf, Mr Speaker. In any event, the important point is this, is it not? Honourable and right honourable members opposite in government and senior backbenchers made it very clear that they would vote to take no deal off the table and break a three-line whip and, if necessary, either resign from or be sacked from government. Can the Prime Minister confirm that indeed nothing has changed and no deal remains firmly Absolutely. on the table? Absolutely. Prime Minister. To the, uh, the Right Honourable Lady, she talks about acting in the national interest. At every stage of this, uh, the national interest has been the focus of the work that I have been doing. That is why. That is why I negotiated what I believe to be a good deal with the European Union. That deal was indeed, as others have referenced, rejected by this House. It is why I have then listened to the views of this House as to what it was that the House wanted to see changed in the uh, withdrawal agreement uh, and in the, package that was, uh, in the package that was negotiated in order to ensure that the House could support that package. Uh, and that is why we are in talks with the European Union on that. And that is why I intend to work to bring back to this House uh, a change that this House can support and changes that ensure that we will be able to leave the European Union and do so with a deal. <coughs> Sir Patrick McLaughlin. Most of my constituents are in awe of the way, the stoic way, in which the Prime Minister has acted over this, uh, these last two years, dealing with a subject which no other Prime Minister has ever had to deal with. There is no book to go and check what happened before. She is breaking new ground. Can the Prime Minister tell, tell me, though, what she thinks is the maximum extension she would seek to uh, our withdrawal. Prime Minister! To uh, my right honourable friend, um, can I say to him, my, my view is very simple on this, which is, first of all, that I don't want to see an extension, but secondly, that, uh, that actually, yes, it is very simple. Yeah, actually, I want to see, it, were there to be an extension, I believe it should be as short as possible. Uh, it is already the case, it is already the case that uh, we are nearly three years on from the referendum in 2016 and people who voted for us to leave the European Union I think will right, are rightly questioning uh, that timetable and want to see us actually leaving the European Union. So should the House vote for a, a short limited extension, I would want to see that being as short as possible. Stephen Doughty. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister was worrying about um, setting a precedent uh, by the Honourable Members uh, for Dorset and, and Normanton and Pontefract uh, Bill. But there's a very easy solution to this. The Prime Minister could bring forward that bill yep. in government yep. time yep. as a government bill and whip for it. Yep. And my suspicion, Mr Speaker, is that the Prime Minister is leaving herself yet again yep. Yep. wiggle room. Yes. And that is on the issue of no deal, because we have already voted against no deal in this House. She says she's going to allow us a vote on no deal, but then she says no deal will still be on the table even if we do that. So can she confirm yet again that there will be no legal impediment to no deal um, at the end of this process? So what is this extension for? To the honourable gentleman, uh, what we have seen, of course, is that yes, the House voted in the way that the honourable gentleman indicated. But we are now working with the European Union. We will bring uh, uh, changes agreed with the European Union back to this House for a further meaningful vote. And members of this House will then have the opportunity to determine whether they want to leave the European Union with a deal or not. And then those further votes, should they reject that, the further votes that I've given a commitment to will take place. 
<laughs> now, Mr Blunt, having heard you, and it was rather unwelcome, from your seat, perhaps we can now hear you on your feet. Yeah. Mr Crispin Blunt. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. I rather suspect that, uh, with all the enthusiasm that Brenda of Bristol had for the last general election, um, the prospect of an extension of this debate for several months um, will be received with dismay by the country. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, underneath that dismay is massive uncertainty, and there is a real price for extending this debate. And I urge my right honourable friend to stick to her guns, uh, to make sure that that is a choice between her deal and leaving to WTO terms. And that's the choice the European Union faced, which will bring them hopefully to end the backstop. And that's the choice the Labour Party should face uh, as well. Yeah. Prime Minister. We can, we can indeed bring an end to the uncertainty. Uh, we can do that. I believe the best way to do that is through uh, a meaningful vote in this House to support the deal that the Government will bring back from the European Union. Alison Thewlis. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all know that no deal will be an absolute catastrophe on so many different levels. But does the Prime Minister ex um, actually acknowledge that her own deal will have a huge impact in the economy as well, and that cutting immigration from EU nationals by 80 per cent will be the ruination of many cities and towns across our country? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady that we have the opportunity now, as a result of leaving the European Union, to put a new immigration system into place, to bring, yes, to bring an end to free movement uh, once and for all. That was an important part of the element of the uh, uh, referendum debate and the reason why I think uh, uh, quite a number of people actually voted to leave the European Union. We can now put in place a, an immigration system based not on where somebody comes from, but on the skills they have and the contribution they'll make to this country. I don't know, gentlemen, the member for New Forest East has perambulated from one part of the chamber to another, but fortunately I can still see him. Yes, he's now next to the Father of Health, very important position. Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker, for that uh, warm-hearted introduction. <laughs> there may be a special place in hell for those of us who want a clean break with the European Union, but does my right honourable friend agree that there will be the devil to pay for any party that tries to hold a second referendum to reverse the result of the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Prime I, Minister. Absolutely, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. Uh, we can, uh, my, our party campaigned to respect the result of the referendum. The Labour Party campaigned saying they would respect the result of the referendum. It is important that we do just that. Yeah. Yeah. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's Government is, as we speak, preparing to apply tariffs to basic food items like cheese and meats, the price of which will be paid by families in this country who have suffered enough, yeah. Mr Speaker. So can I ask the Prime Minister, is this really the Tory party that she thought that she would lead? Banging on about Europe, all the while creating new burning injustices every day they are in office. Yeah. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, that we have negotiated a deal with the European Union which is very clear in the issue of no tariffs. It is open to members of this House uh, with the changes that will be brought back with following our discussions with the European Union to support that deal. And I also say to the Honourable Lady that this is a government that has been dealing with a number of burning injustices in this country which were not dealt with by a previous Labour government. I cite things like the action we've taken on stop and search, the action we've taken in relation to mental health and the action we've taken on the race disparity audit. Vicky Ford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, clearly having no deal with our largest trading partner is deeply unattractive, which is why I've supported the deal. The government position has been to leave with a deal, and indeed the Conservative Party manifesto was very clear that it wanted both a trade deal and a customs arrangement. Yeah, yeah. If we do get to March the 12th, and if unfortunately the deal is not accepted, can my right honourable friend confirm that it will remain the government's position that we want to secure a deal and that if our negotiators do need that little bit more time, the government will not be whipping its ministers to block the extension? 
Well, can I say to Minister my that we have been, as she's absolutely right in saying, that the government has been very clear throughout all of this that we believe that the, the best route for the United Kingdom is to leave the European Union with a deal, and we will continue to, uh, and that will continue to be this government's position. I want to work to ensure that uh, the situation she refers to does not arise because we're able to get that agreement in the meaningful vote and get a deal agreed. Laura Smith. Speaker, can the Prime Minister explain how she intends to obviate the need for checks on rules of origin without accepting common external tariffs? Is it not the case, Prime Minister, that the only realistic way of meeting that commitment in the political declaration is to negotiate a new customs union with the EU? Yeah. Prime Minister. We have put forward proposals as to how we could uh, achieve that. We put forward those proposals forward some months ago, and there will, of course, be a debate on, on the balance between alignment and checks when we come to the next stage of negotiations. Um, Mr David Jones. The withdrawal negotiations are nearing their final, most crucial and most delicate stages. And against that background, does not my right honourable friend agree uh, that talk from certain quarters of her government of immediately extending the Article 50 process and taking no deal off the table are simply giving succour to our interlocutors in Brussels and, if anything, undermining the position of the British negotiators? Prime Minister. I say to my right honourable friend uh, that, I, as I have said on a number of occasions before, simply extending Article 50 does not resolve the issue. Of, uh, of the decision that this House will have to take. And when the time comes, it will be for every member of this House to decide whether uh, we should respect the result of the referendum and whether we should do that by leaving with the deal, as, uh, as uh, with the negotiations currently, the changes that will be achieved through the negotiations that are currently un being undergone with the uh, European Union. But that choice of no deal, a deal or no Brexit will be before every member of this House when the time comes. Owen Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I always admire a good U-turn on either side of the House, and I'm delighted to welcome the Prime Minister's screeching U-turn today and her acceptance that this House must have a chance to vote against no deal. But could she be clear, because she hasn't been thus far, if we have that vote on the 12th or 13th, will her government be voting in favour of no deal or against it? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I'm getting conflicting views from across the Chamber. On one hand, I'm told nothing's changed. On the other hand, I'm told we've done a U-turn. Well, Antoinette Sandbach. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister was told a long time ago now that this would be the easiest deal in history, that we would, be a, we would be in an implementation period and not a transition period. Given the importance of the future trade arrangements to this country, will the Prime Minister commit to making sure that red lines are put before Parliament for Parliament's democratically elected representatives? to vote on in relation to the future trade agreement. That is the way to ensure that the credibility of our democracy is not undermined. Well, can Minister. I give my honourable friend some reassurance. I've, I've indicated on a number of occasions now in this House that as we look to that next stage of negotiations, which will indeed cover the trade relationship we're going to have in the long term with the EU, but also other issues such as our security arrangements and some underpinning, issue, underpin, underpinning issues such as the exchange of data, uh, that we will be looking to seek more involvement from Parliament. Uh, my right honourable friends, the uh, Brexit Secretary and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, are looking at what form those, uh, that interaction with Parliament should take in the future. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. European leaders have been pretty clear that they'd only agree to an extension of Article 50 for a good reason, not just for the Prime Minister to faff and dither and delay and do some more can-kicking down the road. So that extension has to be for a purpose. So will she then make another U-turn and support the confirmatory public vote that is a proposal that is now really gaining support across both sides of this House. Prime yeah. Minister. To the Honourable Lady, I have made my views clear on this uh, issue on a number of occasions in this chamber. There are those who are talking about a confirmatory vote on the deal and including on that ballot paper the option of remaining in the European Union. 
that, well, the Honourable Lady says, uh, the Honourable Lady says yes to that. I have to say to her, that would be not respecting the result of the referendum, and 80% of the votes cast in the last general election were for parties that said they would respect the result of the referendum. John Whittingdale. Does my right friend agree that the whole history of the European Union has shown that time and again, when there are intractable disputes, agreement is actually obtained, often late at night, with about an hour to go before the clock runs out. Will she therefore stick to her deadline, and will she impress upon the European Union that there is a majority in this House for her agreement if the necessary changes to the backstop can be made? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Honourable Friend, for uh, pointing out the issue that he has in relation to the European Union. We will indeed, and we are indeed, in those talks with the European Union and have made clear to them, as the vote in this House showed, that there is support for a withdrawal agreement, uh, provided we can see those necessary changes in relation to the backstop. <laughs> Jess Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I feel so enraged this week with the complete and utter lack of bravery to do the right thing for our country. And maybe it's because I spent my week in my constituency trying to put out the burning injustices that the Prime Minister's government has started where I live. I will not sit one more day and listen to her crow about employment going up where, where I live. Employment is falling and hunger is rising. I have one, one midwife for the entirety of my constituency currently. There are people in my constituency living in hotels and they have to move out because Crufts is coming to Birmingham. Will the Prime Minister do a brave thing and do once what is best for the country, not what is best for any of us? Do what is best for the country. Will she be brave? And at least answer the question of my colleague is will she at least vote herself against no deal? Prime Minister. Say, say to the Honourable Lady, I recognise the passion with which she raises and makes the point about her constituency. But can I just say that, that there is, uh, time and time again, I am asked questions in this chamber, the implication of which is to try to deny the facts of the situation that are before us. And the facts of the situation are very simple. This House will have a decision to take, but there are only three options that will be before this House. It is to leave the European Union with a deal, to leave without a deal, or to revoke Article 50 and have no Brexit. I have been clear that the last of those is one that I will not support, and I believe this House should not support, because it would be going back on the result of the referendum. Dame Caroline Spellman. Mr. Speaker, well, I, I do believe that the Prime Minister has shown some courage today because yeah, there is yeah, some yeah. welcome pragmatism yeah. in what yeah. she has announced. She has acknowledged the fear people have of time running out, and like the Honourable Lady who spoke just before, the desperate need of the businesses in our constituencies to have certainty. Without a doubt, that can be provided by voting for her deal yeah, yeah. when she puts it. But in the event it does not carry, would my right honourable friend confirm the UK will now only leave the EU without a deal if Parliament explicitly provides consent? Prime Minister. I say to, the, uh, to my right honourable friend that, as I said in my statement, if it is the case that when we bring the meaningful vote back, Parliament rejects that meaningful vote, then we will table a, mo a motion to uh, ask, ask Parliament its view on whether or not we should be leaving without a withdrawal agreement and a future framework. And uh, on that basis, we would only leave without a deal with the consent of Parliament. But I would also echo the point that my right honourable friend made at the beginning of her uh, question, which is that actually the best thing for this Parliament to do is to vote for a deal such that we can leave with a deal. Chris Bryant. The very first thing that the South Wales Police raised with me when I was first elected in 2001 was the problem they had in getting up-to-date information from other police forces in Europe um, so that they could tackle paedophilia in the South Wales Valleys. 
Now, we have managed to achieve that over recent years, as I'm sure the Prime Minister knows from her time as Home Secretary. But if we leave without a deal, as she quite rightly said in her first letter to the European Union triggering Article 50, we will not have a deal on security. And that means the police, from the day afterwards, will not have access to that information. How are we going to make sure that we are safe if we proceed down the no-deal path? Can I say, first of all, can I say to the right honourable gentleman that I do indeed recognise the issue that he, uh, that he raised. It was one of, the, one of the early things I did when I became Home Secretary was to agree that this, uh, the United Kingdom should be part of the European Investigation Order. And I stood at this dispatch box uh, with his honourable and right honourable friends trying to stop me from ensuring that we could keep things like the European Arrest Warrant. Um, but can I also say to him that I, you know, I believe that leaving with a deal is the right thing to be done for this country for a variety of reasons. Most people focus on the trade and customs issues, but actually the security issues are just as important. And that is why, and that is why uh, obviously, in no-deal preparations, we work with others across the European Union to see, see what arrangements can be in place in a no-deal, but it's why the deal we've negotiated is the, best, is the best thing to happen, because it does, the deal we've negotiated does allow us access to key issues like uh, the uh, passenger name records and, uh, and PROM. Uh, Jonathan Ginogli. Speaker, um, could my uh, right honourable friend please confirm whether over the last fortnight in conversations uh, with EU members she has heard anything to suggest that any EU country would fail to give us an extension to Article 50 and if that is the case what those reasons might be? I say to my honourable friend that, in fact, I have not been discussing with individual member states an extension to uh, Article 50. What I have been discussing with them is what it is that the UK Parliament requires, that this House requires, in order to get uh, the change that would secure a majority in this House for the withdrawal agreement. Um, but the point is very simple. Were it to be the case that an extension of Article 50 were requested by the UK, that would require the unanimous uh, consent of all 27 members of the, uh, of the European Union, but I have not had that discussion with them. Mr. Barry Sherman. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister will remember that I started off feeling sympathetic to her, especially when she started saying she wanted to talk to people. Then I felt rather sorry for her. But today I have to tell you, to tell her, from my constituents and my people, I feel very frightened from what she said today. I believe that uh, the Prime Minister has lost her sense of direction and has lost the real, the, the real message every Prime Minister should have. Forget about referendums. I, I, I think of Mussolini when I think of referenda. But the fact is, her responsibility of, prior, of the Prime Minister is the national interest, the health, welfare and prosperity of the people we all represent. Will she remind herself of that? Face it, those people over there down and do something that delivers to this House, and there's two-thirds majority here for a sensible conclusion, bring back the, all the benches, let's discuss this, two-thirds of the people in this House want a sensible solution. Can I say that, Honourable Gentlemen, I am precisely thinking of the national interest when I sit down with the European Commission and other European Union leaders with a view to negotiating changes to the withdrawal agreement uh, and uh, to the package that we agreed, such that we can bring that back to this House and get agreement for a deal. Sir Desmond Swain. Yeah, so, that, yeah, yeah. so that I can prepare to realign myself to the metaphysical plane, what is her estimate of the possibility of our leaving on time. <laughs> Can I say Prime Minister, to my right honourable friend, um, uh, it, it is my estimation that it is within it is within our grasp to get uh, changes such that we can bring a deal back to this House to enable this House to confirm in a meaningful vote a desire to leave the European Union, its intention to leave the European Union with a deal on the 29th of March. Caroline Flint. Thank you very much. For 22 years I've served the constituents on Don, Don Valley and have dealt with many constituents and their plight. At no time in those 22 years has the injustices those constituents have faced, whether it's in terms of poverty or housing or having a decent education or a health service, have they looked to the EU for supplying the answers. A Labour government supplies the answer to that. And that is why. It is so important to recognise that in this House there are people 
on the Remain side and the Leave side, for whom no deal, no deal, will ever be good enough. The time has come to recognise, as it said in the first line of the first leaflet in the 2017 election from Labour, the decision to leave has been made by the British people. We said in the chapter of our manifesto, we are here to negotiate Brexit, not stop it. Does not the Prime Minister agree? She needs to show compromise, but so does everybody else in this House. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I say to the right honourable lady, I, I absolutely agree. It is necessary, of course. And we have seen compromise already in relation to the uh, deal that's been negotiated. Um, but it, she's absolutely right to point out, uh, as I referenced earlier, 80% of the votes at the last general election were cast for parties which were clear in their manifestos that we would respect the result of the referendum. And we should be doing just that. I believe the best way to do that is to leave the European Union with a deal, and I intend to bring a deal back to this House of Commons that I would hope and expect the House can support. Stephen Crabbe. Yeah. Isn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it still the reality that the withdrawal agreement, warts and all, amend or not, remains the only serious show in town if we are to leave the European Union. And does the Prime Minister think that if this deal keeps getting voted down by this House, that she will need to stand alongside the Leader of the Opposition, go on television, explain and level with the British public why this House is institutionally and politically incapable of delivering Brexit? Can I say it to my friend? He's absolutely right that, of course, we're seeking changes to the withdrawal agreement, but the bulk of that withdrawal agreement has, uh, it remains the same. It's about intricate issues such as the legal aspects for those businesses that have contracts with the European Union after we leave the European Union. It's about citizens' rights and, re uh, and ensuring the guarantees and protections for citizens' rights. He says that in the event that this House did not vote for a deal, uh, he suggested I should stand by the right honourable gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, and explain why this House had not voted for a deal. I think that might be a little difficult, given, the, given his new policy, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, doesn't want to seem to deliver Brexit. Helen Goodman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I think the Prime Minister's language borrowed from the extremists in describing the bill from my honourable, right honourable friend, the member for Normanton, and the right honourable member for West Dorset as commandeering the House is yeah. totally yeah. irresponsible. Yeah. Doesn't the Prime Minister understand this is a parliamentary democracy, we are in the standing orders and we can vote to change them either permanently or temporarily at any time? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Well, of course it is absolutely right that the standing orders of this House can be changed by this House. Um, uh, in recent times, the standing orders of this House have often been interpreted in ways which was not expected. Mm. Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, the vast majority of my constituents in Gloucester would echo every word the member for Don Valley said. They voted, the country voted, to leave, and we in our manifestos chose to respect the results of that referendum. So, there is no question about us leaving. The only issue at stake, and the only issue that my constituents worry about, is the inability of this House to get behind the Prime Minister and resolve the withdrawal agreement bill. But given that business, and particularly manufacturing, is hurting and will hurt with every day going forward, would my right honourable friend confirm that if she can agree with the European Union the changes that she is rightly looking for before the 12th of March, that she will come back to this House earlier and put the question as soon as possible. Minister. Uh, friend, for the point he makes, he's absolutely right. I think the vast majority of members of the public want to see this House delivering, uh, leaving the European Union, doing so in the best way for this country. And uh, we will be working to ensure that we can get those changes as soon as possible. When I said a vote by the 12th of March, I meant that that is the last date for a vote. And if it's possible to bring it earlier, then I will do so. Mr Angus Brendan McNeil. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And listening to this mess, it's no wonder that in Scotland the EU is more popular than the UK, Mr Speaker. The only sovereign decision this Parliament could take, Mr Speaker, is to revoke Article 50 to prevent leaving without a deal. An extension to Article 50 means the Prime Minister has to beg the EU 27 and put the UK at the mercy and the kindness of the EU 27. Doesn't she agree that revoking Article 50 is better than leaving without a deal? which is the current trajectory for the UK, given the letter she wrote on the 29th of March 2017. 
essentially, honourable gentleman, no, I do not agree that revoking Article 50 is a better route for this country. We gave people across this House, gave people in the country the opportunity to decide whether to leave the European Union or not. They voted to leave the EU. I believe it is imperative that we respect that vote and deliver on that vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. Mr. Robert Halfon. How are you, Mr. Speaker? Um, when the Prime Minister brings her deal back to the House of Commons, I will vote for the deal a second time. I think the time, as the member for Don Valley has said, that we need to support the deal. If the deal, however, does not succeed in the House, <laughs> will she then give the House the option of voting for Britain uh, joining the European Free Trade Area, Coal yeah. Market 2. Point North, a Norway option, which commandeers support from across the House yeah, yeah. and from some Eurosceptics like, Dan, uh, like uh, Daniel Hannan. Yeah. Can I say thank my uh, right honourable friend for the commitment he's given in relation to the meaningful vote. I think he's trying to step forward beyond uh, uh, to a stage when we have taken those other votes through this House. As I say, the first aim of the Government, and my first aim, is to bring back a meaningful vote that can command support across the House, such that we're able to leave with a deal, because the arrangements that we have within the political declaration, I believe, do have significant benefits in relation to the issue on things like, for example, customs, but also provide for us to be able to have an independent trade policy and no free movement. And I think those are important elements of what people voted for in 2016. Liz Kendall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am glad that the Prime Minister has finally recognised that if she can't get her agreement through, we will need to extend Article 50 to avoid the risk and disruption of no deal on March the 29th. But like many others, I fear we will just end up here again at the end of any extension, however long that will be, because the Prime Minister won't <coughs> change course. She keeps talking about the facts, but that there are facts out there that are different if she would only open her eyes. Isn't the truth that she could get her agreement through if she changed her red lines Absolutely. and worked across the House, yep. or if she had the courage of her convictions and put her withdrawal agreement back to the public. That's the way we break the Brexit deadlock. Yep. Prime Minister. Yeah. The Honourable Lady knows uh, my answer in relation to putting the deal back to the, uh, back to the public. I believe it is our job to respect the result of a referendum and to deliver on that. There are those who wish to put that deal back to the public uh, against a no deal. There are those who wish to put it back to the public against remaining in the European Union. I think remaining in the European Union is not the right course for us to take. We should be leaving the European Union. The best way to do that is with a deal. George Freeman. Public trust in this institution is low and falling. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's statement that she, this government, this party, will honour that referendum result? She, like me, campaigned for Remain, and we're equally committed to getting a deal. And can I beg colleagues who don't think this is perfect to vote for it so we can move on and deliver what the British people ask for? Can I ask uh, the Prime Minister whether, in the event that the House is to reject her deal again, which I hope it doesn't, and to reject no deal, can can we use that extension period to reach across the House in the spirit of the member for Don Valley, look at EFTA instead of the backstop, look at variations, because we need to deliver a Brexit in the interest of the national uh, interest, not party interest? Yeah, yeah. Well, my well, friend, Minister. is that we are working to deliver a, a deal in the national interest. We have reached across the House. Uh, we have had... Uh, I think so far limited discussions with the front bench of the official opposition, uh, but we are happy to continue to have those discussions with the front bench of the opposition. But we've also been talking to members from across this House. I think it's important that we get a deal that this House is able to support, and of course, the stronger the support across this House, the better that will be. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister can surely not be unaware of the fear out there in the country about what no deal means. Surely, like me, her constituency surgeries are full of people who cannot sleep at night worrying about their businesses, worrying about their jobs and the fear of no deal. She's told us today that in the event of her deal being rejected again by this House, there will be a vote on the 13th of March to take no deal off the table. I will vote to take no deal off the table. She has been asked several times today about this, and she's lectured us all about personal responsibility. So how will the Prime Minister herself 
vote in those circumstances, if this House votes down her deal and she brings forward that motion? Because it's not just MPs who deserve an answer, it's the public. Yes. Yeah. Well, guys, I say, Lady, she misses a stage out because there's a stage before we get to that yeah. point. And the stage before we get to that point is actually the vote on the meaningful vote and the deal in this House. And I can assure her I will be voting for a deal. John Barron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I gently uh, remind the Prime Minister that we trade on WTO terms with the rest of the world outside the EU and trade very profitably, and that she should not be deflected. Colleagues knew what they were voting for when triggering Article 50. A concern must be that at this crucial stage of the negotiations with the EU, the Prime Minister's next steps will now make a good deal less likely because the EU will hope Parliament will defeat no deal and extend Article 50. When I voted against the Iraq war, I knew I had to resign to do so. Has the time not come to face down those ministers who threatened to resign in order to ensure we achieve the best possible chance of a good deal? I, I agree with my honourable friend that we need to achieve the best possible chance of a, of a good deal. Of course, actually, we do trade with uh, other parts of the world on terms that are part of the EU's trade agreements with those other, other, parts, of the, uh, other parts of the world, and we've been working to ensure those would continue uh, in the event of a no deal, should, the, should there be a no deal. I think it is, but my honourable friend and I, I think, are both of one mind that we want to ensure that we leave to the timetable that is set and we want to leave with a good deal for the UK. Tom Brake. Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister is now countenancing an extension to Article 50. Can I ask her to do the same in relation to a people's vote and for her to acknowledge that a people's vote in a fair campaign, uh, devoid of the extensive cheating of the campaign uh, 900 days ago, is the best way of uniting the country either around her deal or staying in the European Union? Minister. I refer the right honourable gentleman to the answer I have given to that question earlier this afternoon and indeed to the answer I have given to the same question that he has asked me, I think, in every statement I have given on this issue in recent months. Uh, Mr Peter Bowe. Uh, thank you, Mr the Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for coming to the House yet again to update on the European Union? She has been tireless in keeping the House informed and her ability to keep going and trying to get a deal is welcomed, I think, across the House. And I do hope, sir, that she will be able to come back with a deal that the whole House can vote for. But if not, that's not the case, she has, sir, said 108 times that we will leave the European Union on the 29th of March. If that's not possible, does she think the country will regard that as a betrayal? Can I say to my honourable friend, I think that what the, con what the country wants is to see us delivering on Brexit and delivering leaving the European Union. The timetable of the 29th of March was set by this House uh, and has been accepted by this House when it uh, accepted the vote in relation to, uh, to Article 50. Uh, as I've said, I want to see us able to do that on leaving on the basis of a deal, and we'll be continuing to work to ensure that we, that we can do that. But I think the important issue that members of this House must consider when they come to vote on the meaningful, next meaningful vote is delivering on Brexit and giving the public the reassurance that we're actually going to do what they asked us to. Mrs Madeline Moon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What would be the better democratic outcome for the country? Accepting a second-rate deal, resulting in a second-rate future, or a second public vote? asking the public whether they support or reject a second-rate future for their children and grandchildren. Yeah. Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, I think the best thing for the democratic health of this country is to deliver on the referendum result in 2016, where people from across this House campaigned on a manifesto our manifesto, as was pointed out by the Right Honourable Member for Don Valley, to respect the referendum and deliver on Brexit. And the deal before the House is not a second-rate deal. It is a good deal for the UK. Alex Chalk. Mr Speaker, it's encouraging to hear from my Right Honourable Friend that, in her words, good progress has been made towards securing an alternative to the vexed issue of the backstop. Yeah, yeah. But it's critically important that Honourable and Right Honourable Members have the opportunity to consider such a, a new arrangement in advance of any 
vote. Uh, do, is she confident that we will indeed have that opportunity in advance of the vote on the 12th of March? Can, can I say, Mr. I, I recognise the concern that members will have. Of course, the bulk of the proposals that will be put back would be uh, the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, as has already been considered by the House. Um, but I'm clear that people will need, members of the House will need to be able to have an opportunity to look at any changes that have been made and consider those before uh, they vote in this House. Pat McFadden. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has been forced to admit today for the first time that we do not have to leave without a deal on the 29th of March unless Parliament explicitly approves that. But there is very little point in applying for a two or three month extension simply to carry on the same circular discussion with the same parliamentary gridlock. So if we are in the position of applying for an extension to the Article 50 period, isn't it better, rather than specifying a time, to secure an extension for a purpose, and that purpose should be clarity about our future relationships with the EU, because the lack of that clarity isn't because it's in the national interest, it is because it is in the Conservative Party's Absolutely. interest not to have to face up to the fundamental choices posed by Brexit. No. We have considerable detail in the political declaration, more than many people thought it would be possible at this stage to achieve. It is not possible to have legal text because the EU cannot agree legal text with us until we are outside the European Union. There is an issue on which people focus at the heart of the future negotiations, which is the question of the balance between alignment with rules on goods and agricultural products and checks at the border. Uh, that, the spectrum is identified in the political declaration because we have a clear position as as a UK government, that we aim to uh, and want to work for frictionless trade. The European Union is concerned about the impact of that on the single market, and it is that discussion between the UK and the European Union uh, that is at the heart of that uh, political declaration. And Julia Lopez. Does the Prime Minister share my profound democratic concern that in seeking to limit us either to an agreement that ties us to the EU without clear end, an extension of this corrosive period of limbo, or a second public vote, that members of this House now contrive to deny those whom we serve any option that honours the referendum result? Oh, can I say to you, honourable friend, I am very, very clear, as I have said on many occasions, that we should honour the result of the referendum. I believe that the deal that we will, I believe the deal we put before the House, which was rejected by the House, did that. Uh, the deal we bring back will reflect the uh, work that we've done with the European Union in response to concerns that have been raised by this House. Uh, and I expect and hope that I will be able to bring back a deal that I hope members across this House will see is the best way for us to leave the European Union. Uh, Dr Lisa Cameron. Many thanks, Mr Speaker. From what the Prime Minister says, I understand from her point of view that the crux of the matter is the backstop. She states, <clears throat> we discussed the legal changes that are required to guarantee that the Northern Ireland backstop cannot endure indefinitely, but then it stops. So what progress has exactly been made to date in relation to these legal changes? We're, as I've said, we're in discussion on those legal changes. But the Honourable Lady says that from that listening to me, it appears that the issue is the backstop. Actually, this House made clear that the issue was the backstop. That's what this House voted on the 29th of January. Nick Herbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. First, it was a people's vote. Now it's a confirmatory vote. Isn't there a reason why honourable members are using these euphemisms? That in reality their proposal is for a second referendum, and by definition they are dishonouring the result of the first. And will the Prime Minister accept that many of us who fought hard for Remain nevertheless accepted the result that the British people had given us and wished to implement that result and have no admiration whatsoever for honourable members who stood uh, on a manifesto Absolutely to implement the right. result, who campaigned for the referendum, who supported uh, the referendum decision in a vote, who less than two years ago voted yeah. to trigger Article 50, and who now are in plain sight Quite reneging right. on those promises. Right. My, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. Whatever you call it, 
the people's vote, the confirmatory vote, the, uh, sec- it's a second referendum, it's putting the decision back to the British people. We said we would honour that decision. The Labour Party stood on a manifesto of respecting that decision, and we should both do just that. Dr. Rupa Hak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister says she wants to unite the nation in this House, and again, she's presented us today with her deal, no deal, or no Brexit. Given that her deal faced the biggest ever defeat in this place, that no amount of backstop pinkering is going to change for us on this side. Given that no deal's already been twice rejected by this House, can I ask what contingency planning she's done for no Brexit, in the same way as the no deal assessment she's publishing today? If she won't rescind Article 50, can she not accept that ostensibly with 800 hours to go, the only sensible thing is to put her negotiated settlement back to the people so that we can get a fresh assessment of the will of the people, the most accurate one, and that can prevail? I refer the Honourable Lady to the answer I've given earlier to that question. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I encourage the Prime Minister uh, to continue her discussions with our European friends? And can I gently warn the House against prejudging the outcome of that, which I have heard decried across this place <coughs> during these exchanges? But whatever happens over the next few days, weeks, and hopefully not months, I know that she will agree that holding a second referendum would be an affront to the people of Basildon and Thurrock, right, who right. knew full well what they were doing when 73% right. of them voted. To leave. Yes, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right on that. We should honour the result of the referendum. We stood on a, a manifesto to do that. Other members of this House stood on a manifesto to respect that referendum, and that's exactly we, what we should do. We should deliver Brexit. Mr. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope the Prime Minister will forgive me when I say that every time she makes a promise from that dispatch box, it's met with cynicism on this side of the House because of the number of promises she's broken and the number of votes in this House that she's decided not to take forward. It's emphasised today further by her failure to ask a very simple question. When the division bell rings in this House to prevent a no deal, will she vote for or against? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, as I have said to other Honourable Members and I have said to others outside of this House, one of the uh, frustrations in this debate is the way in which people will not focus on the immediate issue that is before us. That is not the immediate issue that is before us. The immediate issue before us will be actually is negotiating changes to the deal such that we can then take a vote in this House on a meaningful vote on a deal to leave the European Union. Mark Pawsey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, yesterday I was contacted by an engineer working for a laser manufacturer in rugby involved in uh, highly competitive export markets. I am very concerned as the 29th of March gets closer about the viability of his company in the future of 100 jobs um, as a consequence of tariffs and delays that would be involved in No Deal. How will the Prime Minister's statement today set my constituents' minds at rest? Well, I hope that uh, my honourable friend's constituent will first of all take uh, uh, some reassurance from the fact that the government is having constructive talks with the European Union and making progress in relation to the changes this House has required to the uh, withdrawal agreement to the package that was agreed uh, in November with the European Union, such that we can take a vote and leave, this, uh, leave the European Union on the 29th of March with a deal. I hope it, but I hope he will also uh, take some reassurance from the fact that if this House House again votes to reject that deal, that I have set out the steps that would, be take, that would be taken in relation to further votes in this House on no deal and on an extension to Article 50. Catherine McKinnell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With every answer the Prime Minister gives from the dispatch box, there is a collective heart sink in the country because she seems to engage in nothing but wishful thinking. And the country are so fed up of watching their Prime Minister chasing unicorns. So can she please confirm what specific circumstances she believes or has been told this one-off extension to Article 50 will be granted by the EU and what specifically she will use the time to achieve? I say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, 
Uh, the, I have not, as I said earlier, I haven't discussed an extension of Article 50 with other members of the uh, other leaders around the European Union table. The European Union, uh, however, in the form of the EU Council and the European Commission, have made clear that they would ex- expect any extension to be on the basis of a clear agreement that there was a plan uh, for achieving the, uh, achieving the deal. Uh, what I want to do is ensure that we can achieve the deal before we get to that point and actually ensure, and if the Honourable Lady is worried about uncertainty, uh, uncertainty in the House, then it's very simple. Vote for the deal. Chris Phil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I voted Remain in the referendum, but just like the right honourable member for Don Valley, I completely accept the result and the fact that I stood on a manifesto committing me to implement it. Uh, The opposition, official opposition, have dishonoured their own manifesto with the U-turn they announced yesterday. I also accept that, despite its imperfections, the currently proposed withdrawal agreement is the best way we have of implementing the referendum result, and therefore the Prime Minister uh, can expect my support in the division on the 12th of March. But if that is not successful, uh, an extension strikes me as unlikely to propose any change, and given that we have ruled out a referendum, the only remaining way of uh, honouring the referendum result is to make a transition to WTO terms, and shouldn't the House confront that choice now and be prepared to make that decision? Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for the commitment that he has given, and can I say to him, as, as I have said to others, that it is the case that I think when people come to look at the withdrawal agreement, uh, a change withdrawal agreement, when they come to look at that, uh, it will be necessary for every, every member of this House to uh, ask themselves if they want to honour the result of the referendum. Uh, and in honouring the result of the referendum, whether they wish to do that with, by leaving with a deal. That will be the opportunity that is available to members of this House when we bring back a meaningful vote, and I hope across this House members will vote for a deal and for, leave, for honouring the referendum. Chris Leslie. The Prime Minister knows the public are absolutely sick and tired of this impasse, born of uh, politicians putting their <laughs> party political interests always above the national interests. And can I ask the Prime Minister not to belittle the genuine heartfelt concerns that many honourable members have in here about the real lives, the real jobs, the real livelihoods that are at stake in a botched Brexit. That That can't just be swept under the carpet. We shouldn't just turn a blind eye to. If we want to break through this gridlock and we want to get out of it, let's give the public the chance and have a people's vote now. Prime Minister. That I recognise the uncertainty and the impact of that uncertainty on businesses uh, and on people. A message I, clear message I get from people when I speak to members of the public on this is, and I was out on the doorsteps uh, uh, at the weekend again, uh, when I speak to members, they want to see this resolved. They want Parliament to actually get on with the job of voting for a deal and ensuring that we can leave the European Union. And of course, were we to go, he, he knows my answer in relation to a people's vote, but were we to go for a people's vote, that would simply extend uncertainty for a further period of time. Mr. Marcus Fish. Okay, can I welcome the fact that, contrary to certain less than well informed opinions in this House and even in my right honourable friend's cabinet and junior ministry, <laughs> very significant preparations have been undertaken for any eventuality by the EU, UK, and Ireland. So, so that now we know, for instance, that aviation, f- financial derivatives, euro clearing, aerospace manufacturing, Automaking, agriculture, and other sectors of our economy will have access to the EU. That electricity interconnects will be licensed, and UK insurance and extradition will be operative in Ireland. And that simplified customs procedure will eliminate or greatly reduce checks at our borders. There are three further practical enhancements to border efficiency su- suggested by my work with customs and freight operators, which she has in her hands to implement now in the national interest. Will, will she firstly authorise intermediaries to have access to transitional simplified procedure, allow them to be authorised consignees for the purpose of the transit system, and thirdly, instruct the Treasury to help underwrite a scheme that allows responsible intermediaries to guarantee liabilities to customs authorities within the transit system. This way, they can shoulder shoulder much of the responsibility for customs away from the border. 
and do it. Order, order, resume your seat, Mr. Fish. Order, uh, order. I indulge the honourable gentleman, whose sincerity I greatly admire. But can I very politely suggest that he he needs to develop some feel for the antennae of the house? The fascination of the house with his points was not as great as his own. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first of all point out to my honourable friend that the issues he referred to that the European Union, measures the European Union have indicated uh, would only be there for a temporary and limited period. And secondly, I think he, he did give a, 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 a long list of various issues in relati- relation to alternative arrangements at the border. I think from um, the list that he gave, some of those are precisely the issues which the European Union have raised a question over in relation to the derogations from EU law that would be required. The consequence of the Honourable Gentleman is that people are now gesticulating at me to indicate they're going to ask very short questions. A bit of sign language is being deployed. Catherine West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Brexit costs a lot, both in political energy and diversion away from the issues which constituents raise with us, the NHS, schools, etc. But what is the cost in pounds and pence to date of Brexit from when Mr Cameron announced the referendum to today? Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that the amount of money that the Government has set aside uh, in relation to the work that we're doing on preparedness for Brexit and uh, for a deal and for no deal has been clear, it's been published, the Treasury have have published the allocation of that money to individual departments. Charles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, You'll be delighted to know I do not have a list. Um, As as my right honourable friend is probably aware, over 70% of the residents of Clacton voted to leave the EU. And I too have been on the doorstep and I too have been getting a lot of mail. And uh, my uh, residents don't want an extension of Article 50. And I can tell my right honourable friend that they don't want a second divisive and possibly destructive second referendum. Now, does my right honourable friend agree with President Juncker that it takes two to tango? And it's time that the EU learnt to dance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I uh, thank my honourable friend? He's absolutely right uh, that a second referendum would be divisive, and uh, we must uh, honour the result of the first referendum. I think what President Juncker said was it takes two to tango, and he's rather good at dancing. <laughs> I'm of East Lothian invariably has a sunny disposition. So it's always a pleasure to call him. Mr Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Mr Speaker. Um, I know that the Prime Minister has talked about addressing the thing that's immediately in front first, but can she put her mind to the fact that the spring statement is due on the 13th of March, and how will today's statement affect that? The spring statement will still uh, still go ahead. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's uh, statement. It bore the welcome hallmarks, I'd suggest, of British pragmatism and common sense, and I will continue to vote for her deal. But she will be aware that the 29th of March is cast into statute law. Can she assure me and the House that in the, let's hope for, not needed circumstances where we will need to extend Article 50, she will find government time to be able to ensure that we can vote on that in a proper and meaningful way? Yes. Can I uh, give my honourable friend the reassurance he seeks that if it is the case that the House has rejected the meaningful vote, that the House has then voted not to leave with no deal, and that the House then votes for uh, a a short limited extension, that we will bring forward the legislation necessary to put that in place? Paul Farrelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also wanted to ask the Prime Minister about the discussions that she's had with the EU, which she's described as so constructive. In particular, what sympathy she's had for such a short extension to Article 50, but she's already made it clear she can't answer that because she hasn't had any discussions. So when is she going to start them? Because at the moment she has absurdly and irresponsibly outlined a course of action uh, with no knowledge of whether that will be acceptable to the European Union. So therefore she either couldn't bring the motion, or if she did and the House went went for it and the the European Union uh, said no, where would that leave us in the two weeks that would just be left before March the 29th? First of all, can I say to the the Honourable Gentleman that, of course, we have to get the... If we were in the position where we wanted to extend Article 50, it would be necessary to get the agreement of the European Union to do that. But um, time and time again, I'm asked to listen to the views of this Parliament. What I have set out in my statement is that if we were in that circumstance, a motion would be brought forward. It would be for this Parliament, this House, to decide whether it wished to ask for an extension to uh, Article 50, (laughs) and it would be that decision that would then be taken to the European Union. 
Jonathan Edwards. Uh, I must admit to being somewhat confused following the statement. So can the Prime Minister confirm that uh, when we vote against the deal on March the 12th, as we will undoubtedly, that leads to a vote on no deal on the 13th? When we vote against no deal again on the 13th, that leads to a vote on extending Article 50 on the 14th. And if we vote for extending Article 50 on the 14th, that leads to no deal coming back on the table for the duration of the uh, extended negotiations. Isn't this the political equivalent of swimming round in circles? Can I, can I refer the honourable gentleman to the timetable I set out in my statement? And can I also say to him that, first of all, I am aiming, and my work is to bring back a deal to this House that this House is able to agree. Rachel Maskell. Speaker, the Prime Minister today announced that she will start the process for extending Article 50 on the 14th of March. However, the process is two-way, and if the European Union partners are unable to deliver in 11 working days, will she revoke Article 50 to stop a no deal? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Revoking Article 50 is not something that can be done for a limited period of time. It means staying in the European Union. We will not do that. We will honour the result of the referendum. Vera Hobhouse. Thank you. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's argument goes we are leaving the EU because 17.4 million people voted for it. And let's face it, her passionate rejection of putting her deal in front of the people again is because 17.4 million people voted for something. Can she tell us roughly how many of the 17.4 million people voted for her deal and how many, like the protesters outside, voted for leaving without a deal? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union, and that's what we will do. Yeah. Yeah. Abrahams. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is low and 10 is high, how likely is it that the Prime Minister will get any meaningful changes to her withdrawal agreement? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, I don't operate on those terms. What I operate on is going out there and working hard to get the changes that can be brought yeah, back to this House yeah, to get yeah, a deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Neil Gray. Speaker, the Prime Minister has uh, so far been rather slippery and spun her way out of answering a very direct question that has been put by very many members across this House, and it begs the question to be asked again. When this House votes on taking no deal off the table, will her, the Prime Minister and her Government vote for or against that? Yes or no? Straight question. I, I refer the Honourable Gentleman to the answer I have given earlier. Um, Gareth Thomas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will surely recognise that the economic uncertainty around Brexit that is motivating many businesses, particularly those who trade in services, to disinvest in part from the UK is related not only to the events or not that are, are approaching in terms of the 29th of March, but also about the nature of the future trade deal that Britain negotiates with the European Union. Given that there is no certainty that Britain will be able to negotiate that trade deal uh, by the end of the transition period coming up, shouldn't we surely extend Article 50 longer than the three months she has suggested to allow more time for those meaningful future trade negotiations to at least get started properly? I say to the honourable gentleman, the a detail of those trade deal, that trade deal for the future and the future economic and security partnership cannot start until we are a third country, i.e. it cannot start until after we have left the European Union. So extending Article 50 does not enable the legal, those uh, detailed legal discussions to take place. It merely means that they would be further delayed. It is. Peter Grant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When we vote on the 14th of March, what happens if the House votes against extending Article 50? Because we then find ourselves having voted to leave on the 29th of March on the Thursday. We can't vote with a deal because we voted against. We can't leave with a deal because we voted against it on the Tuesday. We can't vote. We can't leave without a deal because we voted against that on the Wednesday. If we have to leave and we can't leave with a deal and we can't leave without a deal, what happens? After that, and is it significant that the day after that is the 8th of March? <laughs> Can I say to the honourable gentleman, this House will have decisions to take, and it will have to look at the consequences of those decisions. But the easy way to ensure that he's not in the position that he sets out is to vote for the deal when we bring the meaningful vote back. 
Speaker, the Prime Minister seems incapable of thinking more than one move ahead. It is clear that she is more of a drafts player than a chess player, it would seem. But let me spell out the, the, the issues here. The Prime Minister's deal has already been defeated and the House has already rejected leaving on no deal terms. I don't see that situation changing in the next few days. So in all probability, the House will vote to extend Article 50. But what will the Prime Minister do? Because the, the 27 EU states have said they will only agree to an extension on the basis of a general election or a referendum of some description. So what will the Prime Minister's negotiating basis be? And also, what will she do if one of the EU 27 nation, uh, nation states happens to scupper it by vetoing it? Prime Minister... Assumption on assumption on assumption in his question. The first stage is for us to ensure that we can bring back a deal from the European Union with the changes that this House has required, such that this House will support that and we can leave on the 29th of March with a deal. Mike Gapes. Speaker, in her remarks at the very beginning, the Prime Minister said the very credibility of our democracy is at stake. Actually, I agree with her. This House voted against leaving the European Union with no deal. Yet this government, the Conservative government, has not abided in its approach by the decision of this parliamentary democracy. So democracy is being treated with contempt by an overbearing government. And isn't the fact that there is a conspiracy between an incompetent Conservative government and an incompetent Labour leadership to facilitate Brexit against the needs and the interests and the wishes of the majority of people in this country? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, this House voted on the 29th of January that it would support leaving the European Union with a withdrawal agreement, provided there were changes to the backstop. It voted to support no hard border in North Northern Ireland and leaving with a deal. And secondly, I think it would be it is incumbent on all of us to ensure that we do deliver on Brexit. And the, I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman stood on a manifesto yeah. to respect the result of the referendum. Uh, I stood on a manifesto to respect the result of the referendum, and that's what I'm doing. Janet Davy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has always said that she would not extend Article 50, but I welcome the fact that she is now saying that she may get to the stage where she will extend Article 50, and I would hope that she would get there a lot sooner. On what grounds would she be seeking, uh, uh, seeking to extend Article 50, and what would she be seeking to achieve? I've, as I made clear earlier, I don't want to see us extending Article 50. I want to see us getting a deal agreed through this House such that we can leave on the 29th of March with a deal. It will be up to this House to determine in a vote whether or not it wishes to extend Article 50 if that meaningful vote is rejected. Snell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. For the record, and it won't be a surprise to anybody that I will not, shall not and cannot vote for a second referendum regardless of how much lipstick is put on it and what it's called. And I think in the heart of hearts, both the front bench of my party and the government know that a majority does not exist in this House for a second referendum. It a and vote. it is a distraction a from the it. main purpose of our <coughs> job, which is to find a deal. Have a vote on it. I have spoken to the Prime Minister about workers' rights, about funding for our towns post-Brexit and what we need to do to find a way through this. Some of my colleagues have labelled those as bribes, but they are wrong. What we are trying to do is find a constructive way forward. So in the spirit of that constructive dialogue... The leader, of, uh, the leader of the Opposition wrote to the Prime Minister to set out changes to the political declaration, not the withdrawal agreement, the political declaration that would make the deal acceptable to the Labour Party. Could I ask the Prime Minister to seriously consider and reflect upon those, because the only way she will get a majority in this House and a majority to implement the legislation going forward is if there is a deal that is supported by the sensible mainstream bulk of both parties. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, in relation to the issue of the question of funding for towns around this country, when I stood on the doorstep of Number 10 when I first became Prime Minister, I was clear I wanted a country that works for everyone. And actually what the Honourable Gentleman has referred to, uh, I think, fits right into that uh, 
desire and policy of ensuring that we are responding to the needs of people across the whole country. On the, uh, on the other question that, uh, that he has raised, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, did write to me with a number of issues. I have responded to that in writing uh, because there are a number of points that he's made that are actually already reflected in the political, uh, political declaration. There are a number of other issues where we have taken it forward, as I said today, in relation, for example, to workers' rights. We, I, my team has been able to have one meeting, a uh, further meeting with the Labour front bench team, uh, and uh, we are happy to have further meetings with the Labour front bench team, should they be willing to do so. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, Highlands and Islands Enterprise have carried out a survey of businesses and firms in the Highlands Islands, and they found out that 70 per cent of these businesses see Brexit as a significant risk for their future. More worryingly still, some 30 per cent of these firms only see themselves as being uh, adequately prepared for Brexit. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister gave me a helpful answer on the Shared Prosperity Fund. I wonder if, in the same spirit, the Prime Minister would consider asking ministers or appropriate officials to meet with me, representatives of Highlands Islands Enterprise and uh, business representatives from the Far North Scotland, to uh, discuss the issue and identify the best way forward. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, question. The, sec the Business Secretary has indicated that he or, or a minister in his department would be happy to meet with him. Geraint Davis. Mr Speaker, you'll know there's a bill on the order paper today with the second reading on the 13th of March to give uh, the public a vote on the deal or the option of staying in the EU should they refuse it. Would she not agree that, contrary to what she said before, this isn't going back on the result on, of the referendum, but going forward, because it's asking people who voted leave in good faith whether what's being delivered is a reasonable representation of that. So Honda, le Honda voters who didn't vote to leave their jobs when they voted to leave. So given that she's changed her mind uh, on the uh, Article 50 um, deferral, uh, won't she give the British people the right to change their mind in light of the facts and give them a final vote on the deal? Uh, the announcement that was made by Honda made very clear that their announcement was related to changes in the global car market and not to the issue of Brexit. And can I also say to the Honourable Gentleman, I have answered this question of a vote. Going back, I think it is, I think it is so important that we actually deliver on the result of the referendum, that we don't go back to people and ask them to think again, which is what he's suggesting. Jim McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think if this process was at all simple, it would be compare the single market dot com, uh, where the Prime Minister seems to be very much stuck in confused dot com territory. And for us to get a support, a majority in this House, behind any kind of deal, the Prime Minister fundamentally is going to have to decide who she wants to negotiate with. There will not be a deal that will satisfy her hardliners in the ERG and the majority of MPs in this House behind a deal. Those two views are just not compatible. So please put the country ahead of party interest and find a deal that can command the majority support in this House. I know who I'm negotiating with. I'm negotiating. The deal will be a deal negotiated between the UK Government and the European Union. This House made clear on the 29th of January the basis on which it was willing to accept a deal. Chris Stevens. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister again uh, mentioned workers' rights in her statement, yet the explanatory notes in the four statutory instruments put to committee so far acknowledge that those statutory instruments do indeed weaken uh, workers and employment protections. So th th doesn't this show that the government's promises on workers' rights are entirely hollow and that the best way to protect workers' rights is to remain in the European Union and that demands for a second vote are entirely valid and legitimate? Can I say to the honourable gentleman that we and the commitments I gave, the uh, references I made in my statement to workers' rights, are of course looking to what we would do in the situation where we have left the European Union uh, and we want to continue to enhance workers' rights. As a government, we are already enhancing workers' rights through the work, for example, that we've done with the uh, Taylor Review and the Taylor response to the Taylor report. This is a government that has a commitment to enhance workers' rights. The commitment I've given is for those who are concerned that the European Union in the future might uh, take steps forward in in relation to workers' rights, and if we're not a member of the European Union, then we wouldn't automatically be responding to that. What I've said is, when ch standards change in the European Union, we would ensure that Parliament would have a vote on whether this United Kingdom would, would uh, follow that or not. Angela Smith. This House has already voted against no deal, 
and this House has already voted against the Prime Minister's agreement. Yep. And the process outlined today is indicative of the shocking inability of the Prime Minister to take the very difficult decision that has to be made, yeah, which yeah. is simply this. The best way of serving the national interest is to accept that the only way in the end of getting her deal over the line is to offer in return a com a, um, an indicative, a confirmative public vote. That is the only way that, in which this House will accept her deal. The offer's on the table. Will she accept it? Yeah, yeah. Can I, I've, I've responded to the issue of a confirm confirmatory vote or a second referendum, a people's vote, earlier in response to a number of other questions. Can I say to the, to the Honourable Lady, and I respect the... Um, way in which she has, she is a, has been a campaigner for this, uh, for this issue and has been consistent in that. But can I just say to her that actually the best way to ensure, I think, that we get a, a deal through this House is to be doing what we're doing, which is working with the European Union to find the changes that this House indicated was such that it would be willing to support a deal. Mr. Malcolm MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Culture Committee released a report backed unanimously by its members on the issue of disinformation, particularly in relation to electoral campaigns. Given the release of that report and the questions that surround the Leave campaigns, some of which amount to fraud on an industrial scale, before she proceeds any further, why hasn't she set up a judge-led public inquiry with the power to summon evidence and witnesses to determine whether she is proceeding on the basis of a fraudulent campaign and a fraudulent result. Yeah. Can I, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I think when people came to vote in the 2016 referendum, the British, the British, the British people knew what they were voting on. 17.4 million of them voted to leave the European Union, and we should respect that vote. Thank you. Order, we come now to the presentation of Bill uh, Grant Davis. Terms of withdrawal from the EU referendum number two bill. Second reading, what day? Wednesday, the 13th of March. Wednesday, the 13th of March. Thank you. Order, we come now to the 10 minute rule.